Thanks very much. Thanks again for the invitation. This has been a really nice conference. Um, so I'm going to talk about categorification of the heck algebra. This is uh, joint work with Chio. And uh, this is not quite the same talk that I gave at the perimeter several months ago. It's similar ideas, but just a different style. So um, let me begin. So we've talked about a lot of these categories uh, at this workshop. Just here are some kinds of categories you might be interested in. Maybe the Kovanovata category, which categorifies the positive half of a quantum group, or the the whole the whole sorry the KLR category, or the whole Kovanovata category with cups and caps that categorifies the whole quantum group. Maybe the diagrammatic Hecke category categorifying uh, the Hecke algebra. But regardless, I'm thinking about some kind of additive monoidal uh, graded category. Um, which are like projective modules um, in the sense that you're not describing all modules in an ability category, you're describing things that are supposed to be projective modules. And if you take their split growth in the group, which is the right kind of growth in the group for this kind of category, you get an algebra because of the monoidal structure and it's a ZQQ inverse algebra because of the gradient. So this should be pretty familiar stuff. Um, so I should also mention that all of these categories are given to you by generators and relations. Um, which means that they're given to you with an integral form of the category. A presentation of a category gives you an integral form. Uh, this will be important pretty soon. So these are very important algebras. And one of the reasons they're important is because they show up in geometry. Um, they describe X algebras between Clipper sheaves and Clipper or flag varieties. And of course, this is a confusing sort of thing. I, I have trouble thinking about things geometrically. And what I'm going to describe today, the geometry hasn't been figured out yet. Um, so if you're the kind of person who likes the geometry, pay close attention and tell me what to do. Um, so the uh, sort of surprise is this new structure um, that we sort of noticed, um, some of which was noticed previously uh, by say Kavanov and Rosansky uh, and others. Um, but so here's a definition, um, an SL2 algebra um, or an SL2 category um, is, is a graded algebra over the integers which has an action of the integral form of SL2 um, by derivation. So in other words, the Lie algebra SL2 acts by derivation. So you've got raising operators and lowering operators. So E, H, and F as usual for SL2. Um, but each of them acts as a derivation on the algebra, or if you're in a category, on each home space. And um, it's, uh, it's a derivation in the sense that it satisfies the Leibniz rule for composition. And I require the grading on my algebra to be compatible with this action. Um, and moreover, uh, if you're in a tensor category, I want uh, the Leibniz rule to hold for uh, horizontal uh, composition as well as vertical composition. Now, um, when I talk about the integral form of this thing, um, there's an integral form of the, of the universal enveloping algebra, um, which is generated by projections to weight spaces and by divided power operators. Um, so e to the divided n, or uh, f to the divided n, is just e to the n over n factorial. And what I'm Can requiring I is that these things actually act integrally. A priori, this is a fraction, and I, I demand that this makes sense over the integers. Can, can, can I just ask you, uh, what you if, uh, uh, if you have a category, by derivation, you mean, uh, uh, you mean a di di direct sum? Uh, uh, what do you, what do you uh, I mean, slightly, or I mean, or F and G are they object or object maps uh, in the, the two lines of? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, there's there's a there's an F versus F thing, uh, which is going to change in one second because I don't like to name it E and F. I like to name it D and Z. But no, no, um, uh, F and yeah. G are morphisms. And below F and G are objects. Huh? And below F and G are morphisms. So it's acting, it's acting on morph. Okay, okay, thanks. Sure. So um, I like to name my operators D and Z, uh, and Z is going to be not quite the lowering operator. Minus Z is the lowering operator, and, and you'll forgive me. D is there for historical reasons. Everyone called it D before, and I was just trying to look for another name for the lowering operator. And F and X and everything were way too overloaded. So. So let me give you an example of an SL2 algebra. Let's start with the polynomial ring in one variable. Um, if you want a derivation on this thing, well, we know a lot of them. They come from, uh, uh, they come from uh, differential operators. So for instance, the lowering operator, which lowers the degree of a polynomial by one, 
um, is ddx, and the raising operator is x squared ddx. And both of these are derivations. Um, and so you can compute in formulas what they do to all monomials. Um, and so then you can compute in formulas what the divided powers do, and you see that they are defined integrally. So this is an example of an SL2 algebra, and I probably should have written that the degree of x is 2. Um, any questions? So um, what does this look like as an SL2 representation? So as an SL2 representation and not an algebra, you've got this basis of monomials, D, both D and Z kill the identity as anything satisfying the Leibniz rule must. So this gives you a finite dimensional submodule. And then uh, the rest of D and, D and Z act like this on the rest. And you can see that what this SL2 module is, is a coverma. Okay, this is exactly the coverma that has the trivial sub module. Okay, it's not a verma module, it's a coverma module. Um, in example two, you can tensor together SL2 algebras because we know how to tensor SL2 modules. And so if you take the n fold tensor power of this thing, you get a polynomial algebra at n generators. And the total uh, raising and lowering operators are just the acting on each factor and add them all together. So the sum over all i of ddxi. And uh, if you view this as an SL2 module, it's a tensor product of covermas. Any questions? These are the fundamental examples. So every other example will be derived from these. So for example, the Nilhuk algebra, uh, which is an endomorphism algebra in one of these KLR categories, um, is uh, in particular endomorphisms of the polynomial ring over symmetric polynomials. And when you've got a morphism between something that has um, an SL2 structure on it, well, we know that the home space, um, home spaces between SL2 representations are themselves SL2 representations. So home spaces not as, as representations, but home spaces as vector spaces. Um, between two representations is another representation. And that's how you induce a differential structure on the Nilhack algebra. And here it is right here. Um, you can also induce, so the, the derivation I gave you is invariant under the symmetric group because it's the sum over all i of ddxi, for instance. And so you can, it, it restricts to a, a differential on symmetric polynomials, which has sort of really nice formulas in terms of, say, elementary symmetric polynomials or complete symmetric polynomials, power series symmetric polynomials, uh, power sum symmetric polynomials, and even sure polynomials. And so for those of you who are, who are bored by the rest of the talk, you should go compute this formula. Um, I'll mention that it's interesting. So in these formulas, the raising operator D uh, doesn't depend on N. And you can imagine like this thing varies as N varies. This goes to the limit of symmetric functions um, in infinitely many variables. However, the lowering operator depends on N. Um, so you could do a Deween sort of thing where you make N a formal variable want to make this extend to symmetric functions. This was suggested by Kovanov. All right. So what do you do with an SL2 algebra? Well, you might take an SL2 module over it. And what an SL2 module is, uh, is you take an SL2 module and you have, it's also an A module. And then you just require that the action of SL2 is still acting as it should on the tensor product. So in other words, multiplication is an SL2 morphism. So there's a Leibniz rule. Um, and you can consider the abelian category of these. Um, so let me give you an example. Uh, take the polynomial algebra and look at a free module over this in rank one uh, of rank one. Well, there's lots of different free modules in rank one if you're just thinking about modules, but you now you want to give it an SL2 structure. So this free module of rank one is generated by some vector in degree k. There's nothing in degree k minus two. So it must be killed by the lowering operator. And then you crank your SL2 machine to determine how the raising operator acts. And what you get is the coverma nabla k. Um, I'll point out to you that my vermas and combat vermas go up in degree as opposed to down in degree. And so when k is positive, this has no submodules. And when k is negative, this has submodules. So, um, 
not so important. So here are some interesting uh, SLT modules over this SLT. Do we have a handle on this definition? So the real question is, where does this come from? So I am not an expert on a lot of things here. And I, I've asked experts and they tell me that, so if you think about the polynomial ring in one variable as being the equivariant cohomology of a point, um, they tell me that uh, this D operator is something that is like a homological operator, something like Steenrod squares, blah, 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 that this should make sense uh, coming from some kind of homology theory uh, stuff. Uh, I don't understand that, of course, uh, but Z isn't, and lowering up things of negative degree in typically, typically are not um, homological operations. So uh, I've been trying to figure out where this, where in geometry this comes from, and I really think it comes from the existence of a central C star action. And I can justify this, and if you're interested in the geometry, please talk to me. I have some idea. Um, but like one shadow of this central C star action is that um, I can define this operator, this SL2 action on polynomials and n variables as I did before, but I can't define it on polynomials and n variables modulo E1. You know, so, so for instance, uh, that would be the, the, the polynomial ring associated to SLN rather than the polynomial ring associated to GLN. Um, so uh, there's something that's going on uh, in the C star action that, that, that really requires you working over GLN instead of SLN. And if you're somebody who likes this sort of thing and wants to tell me where from geometry this SL2 action comes from, I would love to help. Can I ask you a quick question, if I'm one? So uh, did you uh, compute the obstructions to uh, having uh, this Lie algebra action com come from a group action? Or? Right, so when is there an action of capital SL2, you mean? There is an, yeah, there's an obstruction uh, uh, for integrability of the, of the action. Uh, there's going to be uh, uh, some higher uh, class. Uh. But all these things are infinite dimensional. Uh, I don't really know how, I don't, I don't, I don't know no, it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. It's, it's somewhat related when you try to interpret uh, to find where this comes from. Uh, okay, that, that, that'd be great. Let, let me know later. Yeah. We'll talk about this during the break. Okay, so what is an SL2 algebra? You should think of it as like a DG algebra, but in some sort of weird twisted world where homological algebra is different than the one you live in. Okay, so instead of having this operator D, which is some sort of complex differential with D squared is zero, you have an action of SL2. Um, and, uh, but of course we do live in that weird world and, and you've been living in it all along and you just may not have known. Okay, I mean, you've probably worked with modules over polynomial rings before and have neglected to use this all important structure of the SL2 action. Okay, now this is part of a more general construction. So if you have any Hopf algebra, you can talk about H module algebras. And if the Hopf algebra is this integral form of SL2, you get SL2 algebras. Um, if the Hopf algebra is KD mod D squared, which is only a Hopf algebra in the category of super vector spaces, then you get the usual notion of DG algebras. Um, so a DG algebra is to an SL2 algebra as this Hopf algebra is to this Hopf algebra. And if you, for instance, use um, uh, KD mod D to the P, which is only a Hopf algebra in characteristic P, you get a theory known as PDG algebras. Um, which if you've ever seen a top end categorification at a root of unity, you've seen this before. Um, but in general, you can talk about this for arbitrary Hopf algebras. Now, when a Hopf algebra is finite dimensional, there's some special things you can do. Um, so as, as originally suggested by Kovanov and, and pushed uh, by uh, Chio in, in his thesis, there's a whole theory of hopological algebra which imitates the homological algebra that you would do uh, in the usual situation. Um, but the input for homological algebra is a finite dimensional Hopf algebra. And this one is not finite dimensional. So at the moment, there's no good homological algebra for SL2. And this is really, I think, an important question. And you'll see the kind of things that I want from it in this talk. Um, so why are we doing this, and in particular, why are we working over Z instead of working over a field? Let me just quickly say sort of the goal of all these things. So um, 
you have a, an action of the Hopf algebra associated to SL2, and you could restrict if you wanted to the positive Borel. So this is just the raising operator. This is the thing which sort of comes up in geometry and is defined on, in a lot of places. And so um, in, in, in previous, I've used the term Gaia, GA equivariant algebra to say, okay, an algebra with, with one raising operator, which is a derivation where divided powers exist. Um, and that's one thing you could do if you wanted to ignore the lowering operator. Another thing you might do is specialize to characteristic P, which is something you can do if you're working over Z and you can end up with uh, sort of various versions of the quantum group um, uh, uh, over finite characteristics. So you, you end up with a divided powers version of the quantum group, but inside it, you have the small quantum group. So the, the thing that I wanna say here is that because divided powers exist, that means that D to the P is a, a multiple of P, is P times something else. So in characteristic P, that implies that D to the P is zero. And so in characteristic P, sort of the algebra generated just by D and Z rather than its divided powers, um, is finite dimensional um, and, and has relations like d to the p equals zero. So this is the kind of algebra for which we could apply hopological algebra. And then um, if you combine these things, restrict and specialize, you get the small version of, you can get the small version of the positive Borel, which is exactly this ring that I just talked about um, showing up in, P, in PDG theory. So, what I'm really going to be doing in this talk is making statements about SL2 algebras. Um, and unfortunately, hopological algebra isn't developed here, but it is developed here. And so via, by, by specializing and restricting, you get results over uh, PDG algebras. Any questions? All right. Why would we do homological algebra? Why would we make our lives so hard? Um, and yeah, I'll remind you more about what goes into homological algebra later. But so Kavanov's original inspiration for doing this was categorification for other base rings. Instead of categorifying, say, the, the quantum group of generic Q, you wanted to categorify quantum groups of the same name. So let me just remind you why you normally get uh, Z modules or ZQQ inverse modules in additive categorification. Why is the split Grosendieck group a Z module? Well, the, the naive answer to this question is because you defined it to be a Z module, right? Uh, we take formal Z combinations of stuff, right? Really, you should you really it's an N module, okay? Really, it should be over the natural numbers. Um, now, the reason though, a better reason for why it's a Z module is that it has an action of Z of something that categorifies Z. So uh, if we're over a field, then the category in finite dimensional vector spaces acts on your category. And how does that work? If you take an n dimensional vector space and act on a module, you get, well, n copies of that module thought of as m with multiplicity space k to the n. And matrices act on this thing, and matrices of, of, of identity maps of m act on this thing. And so there's a fairly straightforward action um, of, of a monoidal action of this monoidal category on this other category. And that means that the Grosendieck group of this thing acts on that. Right, these are, this is an action by additive functors and that's what's categorifying the fact that this is sort of a linear, an action by linear transformations on the Grosendieck group. Um, similarly, if you wanna work in a triangulated world, the homotopy category of vector spaces acts on the homotopy category of your category. So you can tensor a complex of modules over any ring with a complex of, uh, over any algebra with a complex of vector spaces. You know how to tensor complexes together. And so that gives you an action of the growth index group of this thing on the triangulated growth index group of this thing. Um, and the, the triangulated growth index group of uh, drag category vector spaces is really Z. So you should think of it as being N TT inverse. You have vector spaces with a homological shift being this T. But then you have to make it triangulated and you, and you so whenever you work in the triangulated setting, um, shift acts by minus one on the growth index group. So you're setting T equal to minus one. So this is the reason why the growth index group is a Z module. But uh, so the idea of Kalanov is if instead you work with a Hopf algebra, usually a graded Hopf algebra. Um, so the analog of vector spaces 
is the fact that k itself, uh, you always have a trivial module over a half algebra, and that makes k into an h module algebra. And you know, modules, k h modules are just h modules, right? There's an h module with a compatible action with the field. There's nothing special. Um, so um, if you have another h module algebra, then there's an action of this base category on this other category. H modules are monoidal because it's a hop algebra. And so I have a tensor product rule. And that means that I, I've got an action of this category on this category and an action of this goes into the group on the other goes into the group. Um, so if I did this with the usual setting of homological algebra, um, then a graded module over this ring, um, I mean, it's a graded module over this ring and there's exactly one uh, graded simple module and the growth and group is one dimensional, but you also have shifts. So if you're just looking at the abelian category of H modules, which is the same as the abelian category of complexes and vector spaces, it's growth and group is ZTT inverse. And that's gonna act on the abelian category of modules over DG algebra. We then have to talk about triangulated settings and we'll do that in a sec. Um, of course, the, the growth and group of SL2 module is something entirely enormous. Remember, we're dealing with infinite dimensional representations. It's, it, it's, it's a monstrously big thing. Um, now, how do you get something triangulated? So here's where we start restricting to the case where H is finite dimensional. Um, and so uh, Kamanov uh, uses a bunch of earlier results, do the Happel and others. Um, if you have a finite dimensional Hopf algebra, then it's a Frobenius algebra. Um, the main consequence of that is that projective modules and injective modules are the same. And so that you're allowed, what that means is that if you kill the projective and injective modules and all morphisms that factor through them, you do end up with a triangulated category, usually called the stable category of the Hopf algebra. Okay, so this is defined to be the uh, abelian category of, of modules or greater than modules. Uh, quotient by um, the ones that factor through projective modules. And um, in this case, so what is a projective module? So this is a, this is a local ring. And so the only projective modules are free. If, if you view it um, as a comp, so I said H modules are complexes. If you view this free module of rank one as a complex, it looks like this nice little two term complex right here, which is contractible and is zero in the homotopy category. Um, and in fact, um, any, so projective modules in general are all contractible. And the morphisms which factor, chain maps which factor through contractible modules are exactly null homotopic chain maps. So when you kill this, when you pass down to the stable category, you exactly recover the definition of the homotopy category of vector spaces. Um, so what you're doing when you do this is you're killing, in the growth index group, you're killing the symbols of free modules. And you can show that when H is local, that the growth index group of this triangulated category is just, you take the usual abelian growth index group and you kill the symbol of, um, uh, of the free module. And so the symbol of the free module, the graded dimension of this thing is one plus T. And so that's what we kill to get the usual growth index group. And Z is, that's why we get Euler characteristics. But if you do this, say for another Hopf algebra, um, then you're going to get this. In, in this case, it's still graded local. There's still one simple. The growth index group of the abelian category is still ZTT inverse. But now the, the free module has dimension P. And its graded dimension is this thing, which is the cyclotomic polynomial for P root of unity. So uh, the growth index group of this triangulated base category is the adjoint of P root of unity. So in that way, if you've got, if, if you've got an H module algebra, um, this is the part of homological algebra I won't review for you. Um, if you've got an H module algebra, like a DG algebra, then it now gets to what you do for DG algebra is you can construct the homotopy category and a derived category of this thing, um, which are triangulated categories and they're acted on by this base triangulated category. Um, so, the upshot of this whole story then is that if you say, if you wanted to categorify an algebra at a P root of unity, um, then you should look for an H module algebra for this H and, and, and that would be it. So you'd look for a PDG algebra. 
and this should be the thing that would do it. And the fact that they, we found these is sort of justified this approach. Um, I should, let me, I think, I think uh, I can, um, yes, I've got a very good natural place for a break coming up soon. So I'll go for another minute or so. Um, so I have a desire, which is to categorify things over a different base rank. I don't really care about things at Roots of Unity that much. Here's what I care about. Finite dimensional representations of SL2. So what is the Grossman-Dick group of finite dimensional representations of SL2? Um, it's, well, natural number linear combinations of quantum numbers of, of greater dimensions of these representations. So it's a subring of, of DQ2 numbers. And if you take um, integer linear combinations of these quantum numbers, you get be all self-dual polynomials. So you get, say, Q to the N plus Q to the minus N. But if you only take natural number linear combinations of these things, you only get unimodal polynomials, things that describe the dimensions of SL2 representations that always get bigger the closer you get to zero. And it's an observation that in all these categories that we care about, so I'll describe it in the context of the heck category. Um, so it's a pretty classical theorem and I don't know exactly what the attribution is, but sort of it's a implication of Hodge theory and geometry. So to, to, to wild groups for which is geometry, this is a classical theorem. For general Cox of the groups, I, I proved it with Jordy Williamson, which is that structure coefficients in the heck category are unimodal. We know they're self-dual, for, for various reasons, but they're actually unimodal. And the way that we proved it was by coming up with some sort of Hodge theoretic um, structure on the heck category. But I would like to explain this unimodality in, a, in sort of a nicer, more intrinsic way, um, because I think it's a very beautiful structure. Um, so uh, by the way, Hodge theory is some kind of SL2 structure as well, but it's a very different kind of SL2 structure than SL2 algebra. So please don't get them confused. Maybe this is the derived version of that, but who knows? So um, our, our, our new theorem, which is not very hard at all, is that the Hecke category in type A has an SL2 algebra structure. And if the conjecture I'm gonna say later in this talk is true, this implies that multiplicity spaces in the, in the Hecke category are not just graded vector spaces, they're SL2 modules. They're really inherently SL2 modules. And that would imply that structure coefficients are just graded dimensions of SL2 modules. So that would be the true thing. And my dream is that there's some sort of topological algebra for, for uh, SL2, where if you take this abelian version and you do something weird to it to get a triangulated thing, then it kills all this nasty infinite dimensional SL2 stuff and just records the finite dimensional core of some of a representation and gets you down to finite that whose growth and group should be the same as finite dimensional. That's what I want. Um, and of course, I also want it to be compatible with these other restrictions so that we can then apply this um, theory to deduce uh, sort of PDG stuff about uh, quantum groups at roots of unity too. This is where I will stop. Okay, sounds like a good place for a break. Are there other questions? Ben, I have a question that I composed on um, like you know, slide number two or something. <laughs> and I just hit return now. Um, you know how you said uh, when you quotient by E1 that you weren't sure and I was like, well, what if you instead do like Laurent polynomials of degree zero. Do you think you have promise with that? Um, Laurent polynomials of degree zero. All right, so well, it's kind of like a sort of Barbara K theory sort of thing. Um, let's see. Um, I don't know. I do know that this whole, um, that if you decide to invert Xi and work over Laurent polynomials in the first place, then this action of SL2 extends to an action of the whole with algebra on these categories. But, um, but I have not considered looking at the degree zero part and thinking about that as an SL2 version. But that, that's a very good idea. Um, and then also, you know, in your example, it was a coverma, not a verma. 
Yes. Um, do you have any kind of intuitive feel for why that's what we're seeing, or if it's possible to see Burmas? That you so, so, you know, here's here's the amazing thing. Um, I'll, I'll, so, I mean, a lot of co Burmas are Burmas, right? Mm -hmm. um, but this conjecture that I'm going to describe, and I'm not going to say why this is true in this talk, but this conjecture basically implies that um, home spaces should have a lot of nice finite dimensional submodules, and Burmas never have finite dimensional submodules. Um, so, uh, in all these categories, all the home spaces are free modules over a polynomial ring with a certain basis. And one of the things we prove is that, in fact, this basis gives you sort of a filtration of it as an SL2 module whose subquotients are free rank one modules. So these co modules really very, very naturally appear because they're what the free modules look like. Thanks. Is it also like <clears throat> we're saying, so you, you, the unit object is killed by every derivation, so it can't be a firma? Um, the the, the or, monoidal identity or the, no, not monolithic identity. The, the unit. Well, if you're if you have an SL, you're yeah, yeah, supposed okay. to be an SL. Yeah, identity SL2. is always in the kernel, right? So vermas don't have kernels and uh, Lorentz operators, but co do. That's a good point. Yeah, and um, I, I was wondering. So I guess you could say that. I mean, usually people don't consider tensor and vermas together or co vermas, but I guess you're saying the co verma. Yeah, the co verma is an algebra object in SL two. Rep. Um, the verma yes. is a co-algebra. The verma is a co-algebra object in. That's correct. Yeah, you like co-algebra, so. Well. Maybe that makes you happier. Usually, our categories come with a notion of composition and not co-composition. So I, I also like algebras. Right. Fair enough. <laughs> and just to repeat the question that was in the chat, um, could you repeat the definition of unimodal? Because I also had the same question. Yes, unimodal. Um, Describe it for a Laurent polynomial literally just means you're the graded dimension of a representation of SL2. But you can describe okay, so the dimension. So you're saying the coefficient of Q um, to the n is the same as the coefficient of Q to the minus n, and that coefficient is non negative? Um, and, and, the, and the coefficients increase as you get closer to zero. So the right, coefficient yeah. of Q squared is bigger at least as much as the coefficient of Q to the fourth. Okay, sounds good. And one question, Ben. So, kind of this unimodality for the structure coefficients in the Hecke algebra. Do you really? I mean, you were kind of mixing base rings here. Do you also have this like in positive characteristic, or is this only known in characteristic? Um, so again, what I'm going to say later on is that you should have unimodality um, in in any characteristic for a different basis. So the 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 Cousin listing basis is not going to be the SL2 basis, the SL2 canonical basis. No, but what I was saying is so, in like your proof with Jordi only covers characteristic zero, right? That's correct. So, like the case in which we really do know this at the moment is characteristic zero, right? That's right. One of the things I like about this SL2 theory is that it's characteristic zero also. It can be characteristic zero also. Um, and still, interesting things happen. Shall I continue? Sounds good. OK, so suppose that we follow this approach of Kovanov. We take the KLR algebra or, or the Hecke category or something, and we equip it with an SL2 algebra structure or PDG structure. How, in God's name, do we compute the triangulated growth in the group of the Hopf algebra derived cat uh, category? Um, in particular, um, if we know the split growth in the group, which we, so say for the KLI algebra, we know that the split growth in the group is the positive half of the quantum group. Does that for free tell us that the PVG growth in the group is the positive half out of root of unity? Um, and the answer is very much no. So it's, this is, it's sometimes true that you can just specialize growth in the groups like this, but it's certainly not for free. Um, so in fact, there's more than one PDG structure you could put on, say, the Nilhak algebra. So on the Nilhak algebra, there's a one parameter family of, uh, of PDG structures you could put on it. 
Um, but only two members of this family, which are dual to each other, actually give you the right growth indicator. So what's the catch here? What does it take to compute the growth indicator? And this is what I'm gonna talk about um, for the rest of this thing in order to get to some interesting conjectures. So let me just tell you how to like, just it's, it's really technical to think about certain things like what is a cofibrant object? And I really don't wanna describe it, but I think that this example gives you a lot of the subtleties of what's happening. So let A be an algebra, and suppose that we've got a whole bunch of complexes. But you see, you guys have been studying the Kähler algebra, not realizing that it had this differential. And now it suddenly has a differential. You've been studying these complexes, not as complexes, but just as A modules. So you have something which is actually a complex, but you've been studying it as an A module, which is just the direct sum of its terms. And you've been taking these things and decomposing them into some Ns, okay? So because M, you've been taking this object M, you say, oh, it's a direct sum of these pieces. And so I get this result in the gross and Victor. Um, well, so maybe, maybe you said, okay, maybe the results in the Grossendick group was that if I just take the sum ends M1 plus M2 plus M3, and I take the complementary sum ends M2, M4 through Mn, that the direct sum of these two things is M. Maybe that's the, the, the direct sum decomposition that I chose to get a relation, something like this. Well, it turns out that on the sum end M1 plus M2, M3, I can take the differential from M and induce it to, to a differential on this thing. And it's actually a quotient complex. And M4 through Mn is a subcomplex. So this direct sum decomposition, if I include the differential, is not a direct sum decomposition of complexes, but it does give you a filtration of complexes. And so you already get a result in the growth in the group of chain complexes. You're doing category of chain complexes. So this sum in the growth index group, or for this special example, lifts to a sum in the growth index group in chain complexes. And that's great. So that says that, in some, and, and then we'll descend to a relation in the homotopy category. So um, this gives you a relation that was true in the original growth index group that continues to be a relation in, in the, um, in the chain category of chain complexes. Um, and what is it that makes this true? If you describe M as a chain complex, you can think of it as the naive direct sum of these two things, but with a different differential. And the differential on this direct sum takes the differential on M13, the differential on M4N, and also adds an extra term, which is this differential from M3 to M4, and makes that the total, and takes the total complex of this thing. Okay. So the fact that this is upper triangular says that there's exactly sort of this filtration right here, and that you're going to get uh, 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 a relation in the growth index group in the homotopy group. But what if you took some completely other sum in? What if you took M1 plus M2 plus M4 plus M7? <laughs> this is a direct sum of it, of this, of M as an A module. And you can equip it with a differential. You take an element, you apply the differential and you project to the sum end. Okay, so you get like M1 goes to M2 and then M4 goes to zero and M7 goes to zero. So this does have, a, this is a complex, but this complex has nothing to do with M. And so M is sort of X plus its complement, M3 plus M5 plus M6. But if you were trying to describe uh, the complex structure on M as X plus Y with some differential, it would not be upper triangular. There's, map, there's part of the differential that goes from M2 to M3 and part of the differential goes from M3 to M4 and the differential is going back all over the place between these two terms. There's no filtration at all. So you should not be considering sum ends of this form. These are not the kind of sum ends that you want to look at. Um, worse still is that like <laughs> zero is a projective object, okay? But in the homotopy category, zero is the same thing as sort of any contractible complex, which as an A module is just L plus L. So if you were looking at something that was L plus L, and, and you decided to take A module sum ends of it, you might throw in this object L that really shouldn't be there in your category. But this is like a, a, a sort of a long winded way of saying, and I'm trying to go through this fast because it's complicated. You can't even take the Kirby envelope and expect that to respect um, PDG structures, SL2 structures, DG algebra structures. Um, you can put a differential on the Kirby envelope, 
of a DG algebra or a DG category, but it won't give you a Morita equivalent theory. Okay, you should only allow yourself to take certain summands, the kind of summands that appear sort of in nice, uh, nice filtrations um, of objects. So this is just trying to say it's complicated and it has to do with filtrations on summands. Now let me give you an explicit example to try to nail it, nail the point home. In the KLR algebra, um, two strands, E squared is supposed to be two copies of E divided two. And in the additive setting, you prove this by finding orthogonal idempotents projecting to these two summands and, and then proving that the images of the idempotents are isomorphic. Well, we shouldn't think um, about uh, the category. Because we can't take Kirby envelopes, we really have to think not in terms of uh, the category itself, but we have to think about modules over the category. So maybe representable modules over the category. So the existence of this item decomposition tells you that the representable functor of maps out of EE splits into maps out of EE precomposed with item potent one and maps out of EE precomposed with item potent two as modules over this category under, I guess, post composition. Um, and, and in fact, these two things are isomorphic to each other and are isomorphic to Hom from this other object. So that's what we had before. But if we add the differential, this is no longer a direct sum. Remember, the differential acts on all Hom spaces. And you can compute that the differential of E1 itself actually lies inside the ideal generated by E2. Um, so what that implies is that, um, in some sense, if if you think about these things, if you think about their ideals, which is the same thing as th these representable functors generated by these identity maps and these idempotents, then um, this, what used to be a direct sum decomposition when you add in the differential is now filtered, okay? But the fact that DE2 is inside E2 says that this is a submodule. So this is a sub, okay? This is, this is, not, this is a quotient. So there is a filtration, meaning that we still get in the gross index group, EE is equal to the sum of these two objects because there's a filtration. So you should think that sort of EE used to be E2 and E2 as a direct sum. Now it's a complex, E2 and E2 connected by some map between them. Um, but if you use the wrong derivation, I said there's a whole family of derivations. If you use the wrong one, then in fact, the differential will go in both ways. It's not a complex anymore. And EE will be sort of completely in de indecomposable. It has no summands, which are submodules, subcomplexes. Irreducible is a complex. Um, let me skip this term. Okay. So, um, the, the point is that when you're studying modules uh, over a, um, a half, al half algebra acting on A, an H algebra, then it, instead of looking at just all projected modules over A and taking direct sum decompositions, you should only consider those um, sort of uh, projective modules which appear in a nice filtration of, of principal objects. And you should, you should um, get, you get relations with the growth in the group when you have filtrations by some ends rather than just direct sum decompositions. So you have to take all the previous decompositions and prove that they're filtered under the action of your hop algebra. In practice, what this means is that the, if you want relations on the growth in the group, um, that really pins down which derivations you're allowed to use. And it also pins down which idempotent decompositions you're allowed to use. So, um, uh, there's sort of like other decompositions of EE into two copies of E squared. There's many idempotents inside a two by two matrix algebra, but very few of them actually are compatible with the differential. And this is a good thing because finding idempotents is really hard in general, but finding idempotents which are behave well with respect to the differential makes the problem more rigid, which makes them easier to find. Actually it rigidifies, anything that rigidifies the situation is good. Um, all right, I'll ignore the caveats. So 
That's the kind of wisdom on Grossendick groups that, that you might have seen in previous talks on the subject. Mm -hmm. Let me now introduce some new wrinkles because I want to think about SL2 modules. So if you throw in not just the raising operator, but also this lowering operator, and you look at what you get, it looks like this. So as an SL2 module, the differentials really do go in both ways. And this is indecomposable as an SL2 mod, as a projective, uh, projective module inside the SL2 category. But it's not just an arbitrary indecomposable. Um, it's, it's actually something, something relatively nice. So um, it has no sort of sum ends, which are also SL2 submodules. So how do we understand, we want a relation on the Grossendick group though, still, that says that E times E is actually uh, two copies of E divided two. If you keep track of the grading shifts, it's not two copies, it's Q plus Q inverse copies. How do you describe that fact? Well, in fact, uh, as a, what I'm going to say is that as an SL2 module, in the appropriate sense, E, E is actually E divided two tensor with the standard wrap of SL2. And that, if you think about this, the representation, finite dimensional representations of SL2 as being your base category, that, that sort of this is the element corresponding to the standard representation in, your, in, the, in the base ring. Okay, so I'll describe how that works in just a sec. So to, to tell you the category I actually work in, I wanna take these weird ideas. I've been describing a bunch of weird things and maybe it doesn't make sense, but I wanna make it very concrete now. Okay, I'm gonna put it in a framework where it, where it makes sense. So the traditional way people think about homological algebra is maybe you start with an algebra, you'd have its abelian category of A modules, then you consider chain complexes, then you kill homotopies, and then you invert quasi-isomorphisms, and, and you work your way along in this fashion. But there's really sort of something in between, which we all learn about, but we don't really think about maybe as often, so you can take the enriched category of chain complexes where the objects are chain complexes, but the morphisms you take between them are not chain maps, like in this category, they're all um, linear maps between the complexes. This is the sort of called internal HOM. And this HOM space is itself a complex, okay? So we're familiar with this. This is, off, this is sort of the internal HOM, or I like to call it an enriched category. It's not abelian. You can't take kernels and co-kernels of random linear maps. It's some other kind of category. But everything is determined by this category. You should do all your computations there. Most, most people are familiar with this idea. So already you can derive the rest of this, these, these things by looking at say the kernel of D, this action on HOM spaces, kernel mod image inside the HOM spaces gives you HOM spaces and these other categories. Um, you should do the same, for, for DG modules, you can do the same thing. So um, you can look, and people do this all the time, if you have a DG module, you can look at the abelian category of DG modules with chain maps, or you can just look at DG modules with all just B linear maps. Um, and then these kind of things will be, Homs in here will be a chain, will be a chain complex. Nobody really looks at the category of modules over a DG module, because that's just a silly thing to do. But that's actually what we've been doing the whole time with KLR algebras and the heck category and so forth. This is where we have been living, okay? Um, so uh, you should take that with a grain of salt. What we're trying to do is get from here to here, okay? Um, they have the same HOM spaces. Right, the homs here are exactly the homs here, but there's extra structure on the homs here. There's also more objects here, and this is what I'm about to describe. So like a given B module has many different chain complex structures. This may be another way to say it. So you can do this whole story for Hopf algebras too. Um, and if, if, the, if the Hopf algebra is finite dimensional, you, you, can, you can do this Kovanov thing and get the, the homotopy category and the drive category. But what I wanna talk about right now is the enriched category, which sort of controls the rest of this stuff. 
where home spaces in the original category are the same as home spaces in the original category, um, but they are themselves H modules. So this is what we started with, right? We started with the Kovanovata category and I said, hey, guess what? It's an SL2 algebra, okay? That means it lives here, okay? So for instance, if you wanna pass from the enriched category to the abelian category, you take the trivial component of home spaces. This is what you do over a general hop um, But the main point I wanna make is that this category, this enriched category, which lies in between B modules and chain complexes has an action of two things. Not only does it have an action of the Hopf algebra on home spaces, so not only are home spaces complexes, but it has an action of the category of modules over the Hopf algebra by tensoring. So chain complexes with internal HOM, the internal HOM is a complex, but you can also take a chain complex and tensor it with a chain complex of vector spaces. It's got these two actions at the same time. So, um, so here's what I'm going to do. Here's a, here's a kind of object that exists in this enriched category that may not be in your original category. If you take um, an additive category where a Hopf algebra does act on the Hopf spaces, and you take a module over the Hopf algebra, and I take an object in A, I can consider this formal object Y tensor V. So in the original additive category, this is just Y direct some y, direct some y, direct some y. It's y with a multiplicity space. But I allow h to act on the multiplicity space. And it's pretty clear now how I'm supposed to act on HOM spaces. You see, in the category A, HOM to y tensor v is just HOM to y tensor v. Okay, direct HOM spaces are additive. Okay, but I can allow h to act on this thing by the tensor product rule. And that will, give me an, uh, that will give me sort of an interesting object, um, uh, which is sort of different than sort of if I'd taken a whole bunch of copies of these things and just direct sum them together, okay? This is like taking two objects, two modules and gluing them together with a, with a map to make them a complex rather than taking direct sums of them to get a boring complex. Um, and this is a kind of object in the rich category. So I can define homes between these objects very easily as H modules. This is a very concrete thing. And I'm just saying these objects make sense in the enriched category. Um, if you've ever seen equivariantization and de-equivariantization before, this, isn't what I, this enriched category is a familiar idea. If you have a group acting on a category, you can take the equivariant category so in a group, when a group acts on a category, the group is acting on home spaces, say. If, um, but in the equivariant category, there's not an action of the group on home spaces anymore, but there is a monoidal action of the category of representations of the group. And to, the, the claim of equivariantization, the equivariantization is that these two constructions know enough information to recover each other. And the way that you prove this is by constructing a third category in the middle that is both acted on by G and acted on by rep G which is kind of like taking equivariant objects, but allowing all morphisms. Um, so this is exactly the same idea, but for other hop algebras, basically. So in this computation from before, I, I, I now claim that in the enriched category, E squared is really E tensor C2. And if that's supposed to be, and, and um, that means that over SL2, it's this standard representation. And if I decided to restrict to the Borel, that would give me this filtered thing, which is exactly what I was talking about before when I got a filtration. Um, and the, the real reason for this, um, if you look at the endomorphism space of this thing, which is the Nelk algebra, it's sort of classically known, this is a matrix algebra over symmetric polynomials. And as a vector space, a matrix algebra over R over, over ring A is just the matrix algebra tensor A. <laughs> it's four copies of A. But it turns out that this is an SL2 isomorphism. And that's what makes this work. There's the SL2 action on the generators. So 
Um, so an, a, an interesting feature of this is that the identity is, is it always going to generate a trivial SL2 representation. And this is a finite dimensional SL2 representation. So that means that you have a finite dimensional submodule of your representation. And this is exactly describing the space of split maps. So if this theorem is true, then you're expecting a finite dimensional submodule describing sort of split maps, or in this particular example. And this is the kind of structure you look for as a consequence of something like this. So I'm running out of time. I had a bunch more examples. Um, do, 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 but I'm going to go straight to the theorem or the conjecture because I want to state this precisely. All right. So there's a theorem called the Zergel Categorification Theorem, which describes the indecomposable Zergel bimodules and tells you what the growth index group of the Hecke category is. And I want to sort of SL2 enrich this theorem, but of course now it's just a conjecture. So previously, what would you do? You take an element of your Coxeter group and you choose a reduced expression. You take a Bot Samuelson object and you argue that it has a decomposition into some ends. And then you've seen all the sum ends but one before. And this one new one is your new indecomposable Zergel bimodule. Now, I am not supposed to have sum ends. I'm supposed to have some sort of sum ends with an SL2 filtration. And um, in the associated graded, I want everything. That, I, that shows up to be something I've seen before with multiplicity and, with, and, and one new thing, okay? And so whatever that new thing is, if I call it the D, DW instead of BW, because it's not the decomposable circle by module, then this thing is not supposed to depend on the choice of reduced expression up to certain isomorphisms. And so once that's true, I can call it, I, it doesn't depend on the choice of reduced expression, it just depends on the element W. The statement then is that this is supposed to describe all the indecomposable modules in bot samuelsons and, and so the, the way that you state that is that every bot samuelson has it as a filtration with these subquotients. Um, and that's another way of saying that all the indecomposable objects have the form DW tensor V where V is an irreducible representation. Remember that uh, DW tensor V is not indecomposable in the original Hecke category. It's, it's, B, it's DW multi plus DW plus DW dimension of V times, but it is indecomposable in this category. So BS, BS is indecomposable, but that's okay. Um, so this is my conjecture. Um, and if it were true, there would be a SL2 canonical basis of the Hecke algebra given by these DWs. And they would automatically have unimodal structure coefficients. And um, there is an, a, the first example I know of where this disagrees in characteristic zero even with the usual Pazzanoustic polynomial, uh, the usual Zirkel uh, indecomposable is uh, the Kashiwara Saito singularity in S8. Um, and this is also the first example of p-torsion, which is tantalizing. Um, it, if this conjecture were true, you could easily just see what happens after restriction to B or specialization to finite characteristic. And that would give you, uh, that would give you the, the, the result that we've been conjecturing for a while, which is that the PDG growth and group in that cause of our And the final thing to say is that there's Hadriemann style signatures that appear in local intersection forms, which indicates something really cool, but I don't know what it is. All right. And thank you. Thank you very much. And also, thanks to the organizers. It's a great conference. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot. Are there any questions?
So I guess you probably said this in the beginning or something, but uh, maybe uh, I just missed it. So you conjecture, even though you stated it for W, you only conjecture this in type A, or right? Or well, yeah, this this whole SL two structure only exists in type A mm -hmm. at the moment. But actually, Monica's suggestion is related to some suggestions that. Um, I've now received that you don't know about yet, Torga, for extending this to other types. So you have an idea how to get like PDG structures and other types as well? Maybe. <laughs> untested, entirely untested. Do you expect to get a SL2 actions on Humphrey homology? Well, yeah, so um, so that's a good question. And the answer is, is, is probably no. So um, if you look at, uh, say, the KLR algebra, that has an SL2 action. But if you look at a cyclotomic KLR algebra, that does not. So the cyclotomic relation is preserved by the raising operator, but not preserved by the lowering operator. Right? GDX does not preserve the ideal of x to the k. Um, and, and, and so you know what what can be taken you know I, I don't know what you get what this says <laughs> i don't know if anything sl2 can be can be uh can pass down to the finite dimensions. so you said that everybody has been doing things wrong with klr algebras and so on um because we are studying modules and we should be studying the um smiley face category that's right um so could you, uh, for, for, for those of us who aren't so cultured and never heard of the smiley, smiley face category before, is there a good reference for reading about this? No, <laughs> you have to wait for me to write something. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and obviously this is a, you know, I was, I was kind of joking to say that everyone else is doing silly things because obviously that's not true. But, um, but I would like to advocate that more people throw the SL2 structure. So this is something completely new, like. Yeah, 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 I mean, like again, the idea for doing this sort of thing is is really not new, right? Uh, the taking enriched, you know, complexes with an internal hum is not a surprising idea. Sure. But the fact that the, you know the fact to think about BS tensor BS as being BS tensor the standard rep of SL two rather than just two copies of BS that's that's very new. Cool. Thanks. I'll probably rewatch this later. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, also, I can make the slides available. Yeah, that would be fantastic. I can never tell how long it's going to take to go through these these slides on on Zoom. It's so different. Yeah, it'd be really helpful to see the example for type A because it's all been very abstract so far in the talk. And right. Yeah. Flips yeah. The sides and I didn't I tell you what the S1, S2, I, I, I never defined D and Z on the diagram. But is there any chance of describing that SL2 structure on the KLR generators? Oh, that's 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 easy. I mean, uh, that's been done by Kovanov and Chio. Um, and I can do this in a faster way than scrolling through a million slides. So I gave it to you on the Nilov algebra, at least. Um, right at the beginning of the talk, um, right here. So there's also a dual derivation, which is where you flip the diagram upside down. Very good, thank you. And in case you're curious about KLR, um, the differential of a crossing between distant colors is zero, and the differential for a crossing of adjacent colors is you put a dot on one of the, one of the strands. So what would be your reason, philosophically speaking, uh, why there should be an SL2 action and not any other action that we observe here? I mean, maybe there is something even bigger going on and we're just seeing now the tip of the iceberg or something even different. So what's the most natural thing? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an absolutely great question. Um, 
So I'll answer this in two different ways. So first off, if you say look at, um, at the polynomial ring and n variables, right? Of course, there's a huge action of the whole um, Lao algebra on this thing, right? Um, and and uh, this is just sort of the SN invariant part. So I, you know, I, did, I did computations in the heck category, which is a category of R modules and said, okay, um, what if I allow an arbitrary derivation on this polynomial ring? Can I extend it to the heck category? And one of the first things you end up computing is that whatever these things are, they have to be SN invariant. So, so that already pins you down a lot. Um, but when, I'm, when I was trying to think about a geometric explanation for this, maybe, right? If you're thinking about this as the GLN, as um, torus equivariant cohomology of a point, um, then the T equivariant cohomology of a point is this polynomial ring. And the torus has lots of C star actions, which are central. Uh, and, and they all give you these SL2 actions. You know, there's all these DDXIs. Um, but if you also think of it as the, Bor the Borel equivariant cohomology of a point, and the Borel of GLN only has one C star, and that's the one that gives this one. Um, so if you're one of those people like Bezer Kopnikov, writer, who, 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 I don't know, who understand the difference between B actions and, and T actions and U actions and stuff, then maybe you can make head or tail of this. Oh, and, and also, as I said, if you invert the variables xi, you do get a wit algebra action. So um, you get x, x, x to the k ddxi for all k, positive and negative. So then there's really also more examples for the need for uh, infinite dimensional hopological algebra. Yes. <laughs> And, and you can kind of see what I want um, from it. Uh, like I want, when you take hopological algebra, I want the endomorphism space of E squared to instead of being endomorphisms of, the, the, instead of being two by two matrices over symmetric polynomials to just become two by two matrices over the field. Um, to become this finite dimensional part. Uh, it's going to kill all the vermas and it's going to take the covermas to their finite dimensional parts and stuff like that. All right. Are there more questions for the recorded part of this discussion? If not, then I suggest we thank Ben again and also all the speakers for this week. Thanks in particular for um, preparing these wonderful talks um, and, the re and, the, and the slides and letting us, letting us record the talks and uh, providing them on the, on the website. I think this will be a great resource. Well, thanks a lot. I thank the organizers again. Okay, so I've stopped the recording. And so So you say. I I I stopped it, yes. I think Louise is still recording.